There's a line of cars up in front of me, and, I, and I'm just wondering maybe if I could just get off of here and hook back around, I can go to work the other way. So you're sitting there, and you're looking over there, and yeah, it's kind of soggy here and there, but you think you can just, you just crawl up on that curb, and you could just drive over the median and hit that traffic going back the other way. And as you're driving across there, you're thinking like, I don't know, this is a little softer than I thought here. I better speed up. So you're going a little bit faster, and you're going a little bit faster, and all of a sudden the car is slowing down when it ought to be revving up. And it's slowing down, and it's slowing down, and all of a sudden you come to stop, and you hear that horrible sound of that wheel just spinning around and around and around. And rather than going forward, you're going down, deeper down and no matter what you do you are stuck in a rut <laughs> have any of you ever been stuck in a rut man i want to tell you i've been stuck in ruts a lot of times i might be the king of ruts around here actually if i want to be honest with you but man i've been in some big ones and, you know, I found out that if your car is stuck in a rut, all you need is some bubba to come by in a big old truck that'll pull up in front of you, grab a chain out of the back, hook onto your bumper, and he'll just pull you right out of that rut. That's not so bad. But when you get in an emotional rut, when you get in a spiritual rut, when you get in a mental rut, hey, you need a lot more than a bubba with a big truck and a chain. But it's harder to get out of that kind of rut. So what is a rut? I didn't come up with this, but I think it's just really slick. A rut is routine, unproductive thinking. <laughs> what do you think? Routine, unproductive thinking, rut, right? Yeah. That's what it is. That's what it is. It's that spiraling negative thoughts that go round and round in your head. It's like those wheels are spinning. And all those negative thoughts, they're not doing anything but just bringing you down. And the kind of thoughts are when you're blaming yourself for not doing something you were supposed to do or or those negative thoughts where all you can think about is bad news. All you can do is think about what's wrong with everything in your life. What you're, what, what, all you can do is think about how wrong everybody else is in your life. And you're sitting around and you're, and you're, and you're always looking and you're thinking, like, oh, what do they think about me? And you're always trying to guess, well, how do they think about me? And when you... Think about the future, what the future holds. All you have is negative thoughts. The wheels go round and round, and you begin believing your worst fears. And every one of those are an unproductive thought. Every one of them actually are not true. But we're thinking they're true, and they're going around inside of our thoughts over and over. And as those wheels turn and as those thoughts turn what happens is is that the rut that we were in becomes a ditch and as those wheels keep turning that ditch becomes a canyon and then when you're in that kind of place the whole landscape of your life looks negative looks bad and that's just what feeds your soul. And you can actually feel it inside of you. Now, I've been in a few ruts. I've been in some real doozies. I won't deny it, but I'll rationalize it. Because I'm just a realist. I just, I just kind of know how things are in life, right? Yeah, I'm in a rut, but, but you know, I, I, I know what people say, and, and I, know, I, I know they don't always do what they say. They'll do something else. Yeah, I might be in a rut, but, 
Better to be realistic than this pie in the sky, even if I'm in a rut. And you begin to think, well, maybe that's okay. And whenever you're in a rut and you're thinking being in a rut is okay, you're in a bad place. Because being in a rut is never okay. You know how much time you should let yourself be in a rut? Zero time. There's no good coming from sitting in a rut, ever, anytime. Well, the problem with ruts is that all you can, all you, you've got this, you've got this you know, cycle of negative stuff going on, and you can't see anything good. And when you can't see anything good, you can't see God. Because God is good. And God has created us good. And God has plans for us that are good. And God works for good in us. And he is, he, he is, he is always working inside of us to take, no matter what the bad situation is, and to turn it into something good. Because God is so good. And the highest and most important thing to God is to get you out of your rut. And if you're in a rut, for you to kind of come to your senses and say, you know, I need to get out of this rut. Because being in a rut, man, it's not good. So, you know, how do you get out of a rut? It's not that easy. Getting out of a rut's hard. Well, you know, the Bible tells us how to get out of a rut. And, you know, Paul... You know, he started churches all over the Mediterranean Roman world. And he would go in and he'd start a church and he would teach and he would train and he'd disciple people. And then when he would leave to go do that in another place, all those folks there in the church that he just left would sort of like have spiritual amnesia. They kind of forget what it really meant to be a Christian and they found themselves not acting toward each other as Christians. They forgot what they were supposed to be. They start making terrible decisions. He got reports. They're horrible. They're doing crazy things. And then he had to sit down and write them a 12-page letter. Right? That's where all those letters came from in the New Testament. Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Romans. And Paul was always talking to them and saying, don't you remember who you were? Don't you remember what Jesus Christ has done? Don't you know what he has called you to? Don't do this stuff. It's like the way you used to do stuff. But you got a new heart and a new mind in you. And let that new heart and that new mind, let it guide you forward. Be the people Christ has called you to be. Be the church. And... And the church among the Romans was one of those. And in the book of Romans, verse 12, chapter 12, verse 12, he tells us how to get out of a rut. And I love Paul because he's so simple. In Romans 12, verse 12, he says, Be joyful in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be faithful in prayer. Joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. This is a rut-busting strategy. It'll do it. First one, choose hope. Choose hope. Just have this joy in your heart because you're a person of hope. And you choose hope. You choose hope in difficult times. And when you're spinning down and getting stuck, you know, and that's real easy. But choosing hope, that's tough. Because choosing hope requires that you trust God. And trusting God requires that you have faith and a good attitude. And to have hope and a good attitude that God's good, that he's made you good, that he promises you good things, that he's working inside of you. And hope is when you have the confidence that God is going to do everything he said to you. He's going to keep his promises. You know, when you're in a rut, the thing, the only thing you can see is the bad stuff. 
But when you choose hope, you stop and you should be thinking about the good things that God has done for you. You should be pursuing gratitude, saying, yeah, I know these things are bad, but you have been so, so good to me. And we'll focus on that goodness and our gratitude. And, you know, as, as we begin to become grateful for what God has done for us, what happens, the cycle of ne negativity just gets slower and slower. And the more gratitude that we have, it's, it enables us to focus our hearts on the promises of God. You know, God has made such tremendous promises. and I just want you to remind you of some of those. The promises that God has promised that he's going to keep in Romans chapter 8, verse 38, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. You can be all the stinker you want to be, but Jesus isn't going to love you less. Romans 8, verse 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who's been called according to his purpose. And what that means is that when you're in a rut and you're stuck, and no matter how fast you try to press on that accelerator and make those wheels spin, you're going nowhere fast. And even though being in a rut is just full of all these, I can't believe this, i got to call my husband. If, when he finds out, he's going to just, it's going to be just terrible. And what happens if i got to call a tow truck? And what if the tow truck, you know, charges me $500 to pull my truck, my car out of this, out of this ditch and, and on and on and everything looks so bad. And then we have that promise that says it in all things, even in the ditch. Even in the rut, God's working for good. Did I ever tell you that since we have been living, since we have been living in Houston, Darla has had two flats on her car? Now, I have had many flats on my car, and maybe you blame that on my driving, but Darla has had two flats on her car. And the first time she had a flat, as she was sitting there on the side of the road figuring out what to do, Stuart drove past her. Stopped and saw her and changed a flat tire. Second time she had a flat tire, she stopped her car and was sitting there thinking, what am I going to do? I guess I'm going to have to call the tow truck. And Stuart came by. Do you realize the only two times Darla's ever had a flat tire, Stuart's come by and fixed it? Is that not a good God that takes, that turns good into everything that you do? Man, I just had to throw that in. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, another promise of God. If anyone is Christ, he is a new creation. The new creation has come and the old is gone. The new is here. Whatever has stuck to you all of your life, Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross, pulls it off and gets rid of it. None of the kids get to leave with a sticky pad. They all leave free with a sucker. You know, that's biblical imagery right there, right? You got it, yeah. Another promise of God is Psalms 91, verse 3. Surely I will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. No matter what happens, no matter what happens, he's going to be there to save us. And in 1 Peter 2, chapter, uh, verse 24, he says, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. That promise says that no matter what negative and hard stuff you're thinking about while you're sitting in your rut, Jesus died on the cross to pay for all that negativity, all that stuff that's going around in your head, like, you know, 
I shouldn't have done this. Everybody thinks that I'm a loser. You know, you know, what's, you know, what's going to happen to me? And I'm scared about my future. And all of that negative stuff, all the fights and arguments, you know how we sort of replay those over and over again? Well, I should have said that to him. You know, next time I talk to him, I'm going to say this, and he'll say that, and then I'll say this, and then he'll say that, and then I'll just look at him, and I'll just say this, and I'll walk out of the room. Like that's going to make anybody feel better? Well, maybe you might feel just a little bit better. But there's no healing in that. There's no healing with getting even, is there? Not at all. And the final promise I want to share with you is James chapter 4, verse 8. That great promise, no matter where you are, come near to God and he will come near to you. You know, when you think about these promises, when your mind is in rut mode, right? Rut, 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 round, 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 over and over and over again. When you think about those things, if you can focus on your gratitude to God and, if, and you read these promises, it will, it will silence, it will silence the turning of the wheels because his promises are so much greater than our complaints and our worries and our hurts and our pains of the past, no matter what's happened to you. That's the truth. Choose hope. Choose positivity. Walk your life out with gratitude. Well, you know, it's still hard to get out of a rut, right? You can do all of those things and still be trapped in that rut. The second thing that Paul says is be patient in affliction. Now, usually when I'm in affliction, I don't know about your affliction, but when I'm in affliction, I want it to go away. I want it to quit. I want it to stop. I want to be able to do something to smack it, whap it whack it, and make it go away. Affliction solved, right? Do any of you feel that way? Yeah. We don't like to suffer. We don't like to, you know, have burdens on us. It doesn't... Because, you know, back in our mind, we think that we have the power to control stuff, you know? If we're just smart enough, we make the right decisions, we can just kind of control stuff. And as we try to control stuff, you know, we find out that when you're in a rut, you're really not in control. That's what a rut is, right? It's in one of those uncontrollable places. You want to go forward, and all you're doing is getting stuck and going deeper and deeper and deeper. And you're not in control. And you know what the thing you, you do when you are in a rut and you can't manage all the crazy stuff that's going on? What you do is you let loose of the control because you're not in control. You let loose of it because you believe that you have a good God who is up to something good and that he is going to be involved in using whatever that is that you're going through to a good purpose. So just get it, just take it out of your, and let him have that. Because you can't control it. It's not under your control. And when you let it get out of your hands, then you just stop and see what God's going to do with that situation. Now I know a whole lot about ruts. You know, I was, I was in a rut one time for about two and a half years. Kind of the darkest and worst time of my life. You know, I had... Uh, I'd, been in a, I'd been in a church conflict. And uh, by the time that that was said and done, I was pretty beat up. You know... I was, I was beat up to the place where sometimes it wasn't really clear to me my self-image, what I was supposed to be doing, what went on. And man, it was horrible because I, I, could, I could look back. I, I replayed hundreds of conversations and I went through and I said, I can't believe they did this and I can't believe this, is ha this happened. And 
I'm thinking through that, and you know, um, that was a deep rut, deep rut. You know, the truth about ruts is that you're always doing a whole lot worse than you think you are when you're in the rut. And when you're in a rut, everybody else can see it. And even if you're a positive, optimistic, cheerful pastor, you can't hide that rut stuff. You can't hide it. They all know. Everybody knows. And did you know that people know when you're in a rut? Just, just it shows. There were like 12 families during that dark time. And we decided to get together and say, what, what are we going to do? Because, you know, we were thinking, well, what's, what's, what's in the future for us? What are we going to do? And those 12 families came right here, this place. And they sat in these two front pews. What should we do? I mean, all that we had known as church, couldn't imagine not having a church. And after going through what we did, and so someone said, maybe we can start a church. I know I heard those words, but the stuff that was going on is it start a church? It doesn't really, but what, how do you manage all the, th my, my stuck tires were just spinning in overdrive. And because, you know, we didn't have anything. We didn't have a piece of equipment. We didn't have a place to go. We didn't, we had nothing. And then someone in that group, I, I don't know who it was, but someone in that group, when we started talking about finding a place or getting the equipment we needed and start having, having a church, you know, someone in the group said, we can do that. I just, I just want to tell you, that did something to me. We can do that. That's hope. That's hope. And some of you people were here that night on these front rows. I'll never forget it. Carol, you were here. Stuart, you were here. Ford, Brenda, y'all were here. Jean and Connie were here. Melody was here. My wife Darla was there. I I, I couldn't speak for myself in that moment, I, but I can speak for them. That night, that night, the two front row were filled with people who were Christians at their best. Because in spite of everything that happened, they had hope. And I want to tell you, that's how Spirit of Life started. And I want to tell you that hope is in the DNA and the genetics of this place. Because it was all about the beginning of those families saying, we can be a church. We can start a church that's based on grace and forgiveness. And we're going to throw our entire energy into it. 
And yeah, we got a lot of obstacles in front of us, but we got a good God that can do great things, and He has plans for us. And I want to tell you, this church was birthed with hope, and I take no credit in that. Because I wasn't in much of a place to have great hope. But they drug me along. And I want to thank all of you for that. You're some of the most outstanding Christians I've ever met in my life because of the way you lived your life, the way you've walked it out, not perfectly, not brilliantly, but faithfully. You know, at the end of the services, a lot of times I say to you, I look at you and you might think this is corny, but I look at you and I say, you can do that. I want to tell you that words have history. And when I look at you and I say, you can do that, the history of those words and where they come from are the families that got together and started this church when they looked at all the obstacles and when they had all been through everything. And I forgot John. John, don't let me forget you. You were there too. You were there. Don't, don't try to get out of it. <laughs> and see, and see that, that you, can, you can do this. This is, a, this is where this, our genetics take us back to that. To that moment. At that moment where we, no matter where we were standing, no matter what ruts everybody was in, no matter what rut I was in, that we stood and we went forward with hope in a good God that had plans for us. And I want to tell every one of you that have come to this church, you don't know anything about this. But you are the beneficiaries of hope being alive in a group of people, of a church with all of its failures and imperfections a church that is that is focused on grace and forgiveness I, th I think it was maybe about two years after we started our church Spirit Alive I think it took me two and a half years to, to get out of that that rut of all the stuff I thought that kept reliving inside of me the feelings and that had become a canyon and a chasm you know my landscape it took two and a half years and, and some of you are sitting there saying under your breath is longer than that <laughs> and I, I'll accept that I want to ask I, I don't know what I don't know what your ruts are. Yeah, I've, I've heard many of them over the years. You know, I've, I've helped some of you with those. But those ruts where you've been hurt, those ruts where your, maybe your childhood was, was nothing like it should have been. I don't know who's hurt you. I, I don't know who's abandoned you, who's left you behind those ruts that that some of us I know maybe you're like me and say well I'll, I'm a realist you know I can handle it it's okay I don't need to think about it anymore that's that's just that's just talk from somebody standing in a rut you just gotta I know that because I, I did the talk too You see, these lies keep spinning in our heads. You're not really loved. You're not good enough. You're such a loser. You don't have a future. This isn't going to last. Those are all lies. And they're, they're spinning around in your head. And see, what Jesus does 
is that the Bible says that Jesus is the truth. He always tells you the truth. I don't particularly like it when people come and tell me the truth sometimes, you know, because it's just like, <laughs> right there. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But the truth is that he loves you. And the truth is, is that he values your life. And it doesn't matter whether anybody else does. He values your life so much that he gave his on the cross for you. He loves you. He has good plans for you. You know, let me, let me, let me qualify this good plans. Good plans is not the wonderful, happy life that I want. The good life is being that one right person in the one right place in those moments where you can speak for Jesus Christ into the hearts of someone else and to be there and stand next to those people. That's a good life. When you are a part of bringing someone in the kingdom of God, that's a good life. When you were there encouraging someone through these difficult times and praying for someone during those difficult times, that is a good life because that's God's objection to bring everybody to faith in Jesus Christ. He's all about creating a new heart and mind inside of you. And that's why you have to be patient during affliction. Be patient when you're stuck in that rut let go of trying to control everything. And be patient and watch what, and watch what God's going to do. That night when we were all sitting here, us 12 families and me, when, I was, when everything was out of control, I, I was just sitting there powerless and just patient. And you know what God did? He gave birth to a church. He gave birth to a church. And we've been that church ever since the last thing that Paul says is he says be faithful in prayer you know there's a lot of ways to pray some people like to pray in big groups some people like to shout it from the rooftops you know some people pray quietly they pray alone that that prayer life is it's just something that is inside and it's, it's fervently practiced. Sometimes people pray to songs and they let the songs speak the words that are going on in their hearts. Paul says, be faithful in prayer. Be faithful in prayer. And when you're in prayer, you need to pray for two things. Because, you know, a lot of times in our prayers, we're praying for a lot of things that we shouldn't be praying for. Like, I'd like, you to, I'd, I'd like Tom to get what he really deserves. God, can you do that for me? Can you stop this? Can you, you know, bring a pestilence on, you know, this, this whole northeast side of town, you know, wipe those folks. I mean, we have the, now that's what's going on inside of us, right? It's that, it's that get evil, justification. I want to be shown right because I was right, God. You, you go out there and you show them. Send your mighty angels down, you know. Wipe out the evil Pal Palestine horde uh, that have possessed the land of Israel. That's, that's, don't pray for that. That's just feeding the anger that's inside of there. And the big one is that we're praying that people get what they deserve. I just got to tell you, if you pray for people to get what they deserve in that rut-based thinking... You know, God didn't give you what you deserved. He sent Jesus Christ to be your Savior. He, he gave you what you didn't deserve. And accepting that forgiveness and that grace that he gives us, it puts us in a position where we're supposed to give the forgiveness and love just like it was given to us. Pray for two things in a rut. Pray for a pathway to forgive because, you know, that's the thing that's keeping you in the rut. Being so mad and so angry and you're not going to forgive. That's what's keeping you in the rut. You're looking at what was done, how wrong it was. It wasn't right. It wasn't fair. But when you turn your heart in a rut and you pray... 
for a pathway to forgive. I guarantee you Jesus will open one up. You'll see it. You'll see it. And the second thing you pray for is a new heart and a new mind. I need a new heart and a new mind. I need a, I need a new heart that's healed by you. And I need a new mind that quits this rut thinking, you know, spinning the wheels. And when we ask Jesus to give us that pathway to forgive and a new heart and a new mind, what Jesus does is he reaches his hand out and he'll take yours. Because listen, I'm telling you, nobody can get out of a rut all by themselves. They could just learn to stand in that rut. But the only person that can pull you out of a rut, and that's Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ will work through people that are around you too. That hand will reach out to you in so many ways. And it'll pull you out of that rut. I know all about this. I've been there, seen it. And, and I have to be truthful with you. There are ruts everywhere. And you're going to run into them every day. <laughs> you know? It's like we're living in a Louisiana bog. Trying to drive our, our little car slow to the ground through the bog. I mean, we're going we're to get stuck all the time. We're going to get stuck all the time. But you see, we don't have to stay in ruts. We don't have to live in ruts. Because Jesus takes our hand and pull him out of it. I don't know. Are, maybe you're in a rut here today. Maybe you're in a rut. And it's just the perfect opportunity to say, I need your truth to speak to those lies and negative thinking that's going on inside of me and to, to stop living there in that place ask for the forgiveness of Jesus Christ to forgive you and create in me a clean heart O God and renew in me a right spirit and when we pray that prayer Jesus' hand pulls us out and you know you you have, you have people around you that will help you stay out of the rut. Stay out of the rut. You know who the people that you need to look at, look toward to help you stay out of the rut? When you start talking about those things that are going, I just need to tell you about something. And you start going around and around on those things and it's all about that past stuff. You want a good, you want a good friend that just listens but doesn't say anything. What you want that person to say I got to tell you what you're thinking there's wrong. It's a lie. Don't go be with somebody in a rut and, and get down in there. But you speak words that will help them get out of that rut. Those words that direct us toward the future. You see, we have a choice when we're in a rut. We can hold on to a small thing that is all about the stuff that has just happened that was unfair and unjust. We can hold on to that small thing and what we are doing then is we are missing the bigger thing that God is calling us to. It's in the future. It's full of hope. It's full of his promises. You be the friend that's there and says, let's, let's turn to Jesus. Let's, let's, let's step out of that rut. Let's go forward because we've got a good God. He's got good plans for us and he can work his good even in that stuff that's been back there. Let's leave it on. Let's leave it. Let's leave it. You know, it wasn't until I left, I left all that churning and all of that anger and everything that had happened in, in the past. It wasn't until the goodness and the encouragement. And you know, you original folks, y'all were really good. And that is, you, you, you always spoke to me about forward. Forward. I want to thank you for that. You were the best of all Christian friends. The best of all Christian comrades. Let's be that kind of Christian to each and every one of our friends who are in a rut. 
And my God, if you see me in one, just come and tell me about it. Because you know, if I see you in one, I'll come talk to you about it, right? Yeah. Because that, that really is what our lives together as a church is all about. Today, just, just give that right to Jesus. He'll pull you free. He'll pull you free. You let go of that little thing that, that he has given you forgiveness for and doesn't want you to hold on to it, to place in your hand something great and powerful for the future. You want to get out of rut, a rut today? Want to just step right out? Let's just, let's just do that, right? Just close your eyes, bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for Jesus Christ and every promise you've ever made to us, you have made it good. And, and Lord, we, we pray that you would, through the work of your Holy Spirit, move our hearts toward a, a gratitude kind of place where we receive hope and where we trust your promises and we step out of the ruts that we're in. Lord, free me from my ruts. Help me to have enough sense after all these years, not just walk, drive right through another one. But when I do, Lord, help it be a quick stay. And Lord, speak to me the words of truth that help me to remember who you've called me to be and what you want me to do. And I pray that for everyone here that you would answer that same prayer in their heart. Lord, let them, Lord, hear that, hear the thoughts and prayers right now of every person here. And Lord, let, just, just lead us to that special place where we give you our heart. We give you your heart. We give our hearts to you. And Lord, we pray for your hand to reach out and lift us from that rut to a new heart and a new mind kind of place to live for you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Let's, let's walk out of the rut. If you're ready to do that, let's just walk right out of the rut. Now, you can do this. You can do this. And that's an old word that's, that goes back to a story long ago that God has used and brought blessings into a lot of people's lives because you can do that. And he will. God bless you and give you a great week.